Okay, so our first talk of the morning session uh, will be given by Zoltan Sylvester from the Bureau of Economic Geology down in Texas and on Meander Pi, a simple model of meandering. Thank you, Greg. And thank you so much for, uh, for having me here. Um, so I'm a, I'm a research scientist at, uh, at the Bureau of Economic Geology, which is part of uh, the Jackson School of uh, Geosciences at UT Austin. Uh, and I'm a member of a research group called the Quantitative Classics Laboratory, uh, headed by Jay Kovold. Uh, and uh, we are funded by an in industrial consortium, and I'm thankful for the sponsors of, of QCL. Uh, I'm also uh, thankful to my collaborators and co-authors, Jay Kovold, Paul Durkin, Steve Hubbard, and David Mori. And what I want to do today is uh, talk about a simple model of meandering, which I call meander pie. Uh, but it would be pretty boring and potentially short if I only talked about the model itself. So I also want to talk about uh, how we used this model to better understand uh, uh, data, especially data from satellite imagery, and the other way around how uh, looking at satellite imagery helped better understand what, uh, uh, how good the model is and uh, what else can it uh, 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 help us with. Um, I don't think I need to, in, in this room, I don't think I need to elaborate a lot on why meandering uh, systems are important. Uh, if you uh, if you live closer to the uh, to the coast as, as as I do, then you probably don't live very far from a from a meandering river. Every one of these uh, valleys, incised valleys uh, along the Gulf Coast, is occupied today by a beautiful meandering river. Uh, we uh, live near meandering rivers. We live on deposits uh, deposited by meandering rivers. We get our water from, uh, uh, from sediments of meandering rivers. We get our oil and gas, uh, and uh, uh, we uh, store CO2 in the deposits of meandering rivers. Um, so what are the, some of the points I want to touch on here? Uh, first, uh, just talk a little bit about the, the model, which is, a, which is a, to stay the obvious, the Python model. Then uh, uh, this model is, is strongly related to how you, uh, how you link migration to curvature. Uh, so uh, I want to revisit that problem a little bit, uh, then talk about how satellite imagery uh, confirms or doesn't, uh, uh, how well the model works. Uh, and finally, uh, talk a little bit about uh, counterpoint bars or in more simple terms, just the downstream termination of point bars, what's going on there, and how that also links to this model. And uh, if, if, uh, uh, if I think about it, uh, uh, fundamentally, this is, uh, uh, as, as uh, reviewer number two said correctly, this is not new. Uh, essentially, uh, there are two papers that uh, all I'm saying, that these two papers are, are amazing. Uh, and uh, one of them is uh, this paper by uh, Alan Howard and Thomas Knudsen, uh, which is uh, probably one of the first uh, uh, computer simulation papers uh, in, the, in the earth sciences, uh, sufficient conditions for river meandering a simulation approach. And uh, this paper essentially says, and shows how to do it on a computer. It says that, uh, uh, Migration rate is a function of the weighted sum of upstream curvatures. And you get back to that. The second paper uh, is by David John Furbish. Uh, and it adds to this that because of the fact that migration rate is the weighted sum of upstream curvatures, uh, we shouldn't try to compare uh, local migration rate with local curvature. And, uh, I think Furbish was so polite in this paper that, that uh, in, in it, it didn't get the attention that I think it deserves. 
So what I did, I kind of combined the ideas in these two papers and, uh, and uh, Pythonized uh, uh, this, uh, this model. Uh, and, and probably no need to advertise Python here, but uh, it, it, since I started using Python, it, it, it has changed my life. I'm not, I'm not exaggerating. Uh, anyway, let's, uh, let's get to the model. Um, it's, uh, I think it's super simple. There are, uh, uh, it's it's uh, object-based and the objects are the obvious objects that you would have in a model like this. Uh, uh, we have a, a channel object, which you see several of those in, in this plot. Uh, we have cutoffs uh, and then uh, those channels and cutoff combine, cutoffs combine to form a channel belt. Uh, and then uh, there are some key methods that you can use. You can use on channel belts. You can migrate further an existing channel belt. You can plot it. And finally, you can build a 3D model. Uh, and when you build a 3D model, you generate another object, uh, 3D channel belt. And the key uh, uh, characteristics of a 3D channel belt is topography, stratigraphy. Uh, at every time step, you have these and uh, you can assign faces to the layers. Uh, and I just made this public uh, on GitHub. All I'm hoping is that this is good enough that it is worth finding errors in it. So please do that. Um, so uh, one way to display the results is this uh, plan view plot, uh, which I call a stratigraphic display. You basically see everything, all the cutoffs and all the channels that uh, moves through here and the latest channel is highlighted in darker blue. Uh, now we know that uh, in, in, on the surface in Google Earth, you don't really see this uh, because it's covered by vegetation uh, and oxbows are filled up. So I, we, we created a version, a display version where you can assign an age, to basically not an age, but a rate of, uh, of, of cover up by vegetation of the point bars and oxbows uh, and you get something like this. So that versus this, and this really shows how quickly you can cover up a lot, a lot what has happened. And often in Google Earth, you don't really see the extent of meander, meander belts. Uh, have a quick look at, at an animation. Um, this is probably a bit too fast. Uh, I, I, you can get busy if you want to watch it uh, for too long. And, and uh, it, it is pretty well known that these simple models uh, generate these, uh, these sometimes weird looking very elongated meanders. And I think that's a fair criticism. The ways to tune the parameters to try to minimize that, but it's, it's uh, still there. But to me, it's uh, one of the key questions. It's not so much the, the shape of the exact shape of every meander, but uh, does the movement, does the change uh, in the model uh, uh, right, is that represent, representative of uh, what we see in nature? A little bit about building a 3D model, and I hesitated to put this in, but because it's so simple. Uh, but the idea is that, uh, uh, and this goes back to uh, some old work uh, that we did with uh, Carlos Pirmes and Alessandro Cantelli, uh, and this was for submarine channels. Uh, so you start with an, in an initial channel form. Uh, then we have a depositional surface, uh, which is a Gaussian uh, in this case. And wherever the Gaussian lies above this pre-existing surface, you have deposition. Uh, uh, then you have an erosional surface. Wherever that erosional surface uh, cuts the pre-existing surface, you have erosion. Uh, this is a parabola. Uh, uh, and then let's call this levy deposition. Levies are thick here because this is supposed to be submarine. Uh, uh, and then after five steps, you get something like this. Um, this uh, all happens uh, in a vectorized format in NumPy, so it's, it's really quick. Uh, uh, and uh, you can switch out if you don't like these, these parameterizations of these surfaces, you can just switch them out if you want to. So if you do that, you can generate, for example, an incised valley like this, slightly incision, incisional river, all kinds of autogenic terraces, uh, Yellow is roughly speaking sand. If you zoom in, you can see some of the uh, oxbow fields uh, and the geometries of the, of the point bars. 
Um, one of my uh, uh, favorite things to go on and on about is how submarine channels are not that different from fluvial channels, certainly not in plan view. Uh, and this is an example from the Bengal fan, horizon slides from a seismic, uh, beautiful seismic data volume uh, compared to uh, 27 years of the Ucayali River in Peru. Uh, and uh, if I only gave you the center lines from the river and the center lines, reconstructed center lines from the seismic image, it would be impossible to tell which one is which. Uh, I have, we, we haven't done the quantitative comparison in these patterns yet, but uh, I, I, my intuition is that there is no fundamental difference. Um, therefore, we can use the Howard and Knudsen model to build models of uh, submarine channels. Here is an aggradational one. This is vertically saturated, I think like five times, big levees in submarine uh, channel levee systems. Uh, and you can also see, because of the higher aggradation rates than what you can see in rivers, uh, the sinuosity combined with that high aggradation rates results in, uh, in, in quite complicated uh, structures in 3D. Uh, uh, and then you can start thinking about, uh, for example, fluid flow in these kinds of uh, 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 stratigraphic successions. Here is an incising submarine channel. Uh, one of the things I didn't mention is that the model is allows for variable z. Uh, you can introduce a slope. Uh, and what happens if you do that, if you have cutoffs, uh, you generate uh, nick points. It's not very obvious from this plot, but whenever you have a cutoff, you have a steep segment, just like in reverse. The difference here is that these, these things can be very steep uh, on the continental slope. So these nick points can be uh, really important in submarine channels. Um, but let's come to this point about um, the relationship between curvature and migration rate. And this is a fundamental uh, problem in, uh, in fluvial uh, geomorphology. Uh, and uh, probably the first uh, uh, paper that really tried to address this uh, in a careful and quantitative way was this paper by Hitton and Nansen in 1975, where they went to a number of meanders, number of point bars, uh, in Canada, and they use dendrochronology to estimate the ages of the, of the scrolls along these, uh, these point bars. And they made a plot, uh, which is a highly influential plot, where they plotted the radius of uh, curvature, uh, normalized by channel width, and they plotted migration rate against it. And they, uh, they said that there seems to be this relationship where at uh, low curvatures, which is actually over here, Curvature is one over radius of curvature, of course. So low curvatures, low migration rates, then you reach a, a high a maximum migration somewhere in the middle at, at around three uh, for this parameter. And then migration rate declines again if you go to higher, higher curvatures, which are over here. And that is a little bit not intuitive because uh, in theory, the higher, the, the sharper the band, the more, the stronger the centrifugal force, and, and you would expect in just you know, very basic physics, uh, you would expect more, more migration over here. And I think one of, the, one of the questions here is that, why should we plot migration rate following that logic? Why should we plot it against uh, radius of curvature instead of curvature itself, right? And second, uh, as, Furbish has pointed out, migration rate is not a function of only the local curvature. So plotting the local migration rate, in this case, this was averaged over whole point bars, so uh, it's fair enough. Uh, local migration rates were not that easy to estimate at that time, uh, but we should really think about this part. Um, and I did a lot of research on YouTube to find ways to illustrate this problem, but here is an icy road somewhere in Russia, and soon there you will see some cars coming along here. And the question is, here is the uh, maximum curvature point. Uh, the question is, will the cars tend to go off the road right where you have the maximum curvature? Is migration rate in phase with curvature, or is, it, is, is this going to happen somewhere else? So think about that for a second, and then I will let these uh, I don't know if this is a setup or it, this, this happens all the time in Russia, but 
but uh, but this is what happens. So you can see that if this was a river, the highest migration rate would be somewhere there, right? So it's it's downstream from maximum curvature, uh, and that's I think that's a fundamental property of meandering. Um, often people come to me after I give this talk and uh, tell me that, uh, uh, you know, I, I excellent talk, uh, those cars were amazing. Um, um, so uh, let's do this in a bit more uh, scientific way, uh, although pretty, pretty basic uh, uh, manner, just these are just some plots. Uh, here is curvature. Uh, uh, plotted uh, the curvature vectors plotted in, in black for two bends. Uh, needless to say, curvature is not uh, not constant. It goes from zero at the inflection point and reaches the maximum and so on. Now, if you use uh, the Howard and Knudsen style model, uh, weight system of upstream curvatures, then we get the migration rate, which looks like this. And you can see in this plot very nicely that uh, migration rate uh, just uh, as we saw, it's shifted uh, downstream relative to curvature. Um, and uh, uh, here is a, uh, so, so one of the outcome of this, uh, of this model is that there will be these segments like, like here, uh, where curvature, the curvature vector is going in the opposite direction from the migration vector. And these are the location, these are the, the downstream ends of, of point bars, which uh, a lot of people call, certainly in the sedimentological community, call uh, counterpoint bars. And we'll get back to these a bit later, uh, but keep that in mind. These, if, if this works, then uh, this is, there is a characteristic length to these, uh, to these locations on, uh, along the river. It's the length of this leg. And in the model, uh, this is a quasi-constant uh, uh, distance for a given a certain discharge and river size and so on. Uh, also, uh, we can think about how to compare curvature and migration rate. Those are the two curves. If we really want to predict migration rate on curvature, then we should take into account that there is a phase shift. It's not, not that complicated. So uh, uh, just to illustrate that point further, uh, here are again those two curves. When I, this comes from, from Alan Howard, nominal migration rate is just a, uh, uh, just a version of curvature uh, so that it uh, has the dimensions of migration rate. Uh, so if we compare a local curvature with local migration rate and we plot them alongside, uh, in a scatter plot, then we start seeing the, the similar relationship to what Hicken and Manson observed, which is you reach a maximum migration rate for a given uh, uh, for a given curvature. Again, this this is the equivalent of curvature. So for this curvature, it looks like I have a maximum migration rate. And then if I go sharper to the right, then it starts declining. I think this is one of the reasons why you get those Hicken and Nansen style plots. Now, if I take into account the phase shift just by shifting like six positions, the, those two curves, you get a simpler plot, it's, which suggests that you know, these curves are similar to each other, uh, and they are. But uh, this is all good. How well uh, does this model work in nature? And uh, it is, I, I think this is an amazing time to have so much data, uh, so much uh, remote sensing data uh, from all these rivers. and. Uh, one of the few reasons I'm looking forward to getting uh, older is that uh, I can add more frames to this animation. Um, um, and uh, so, so we want to measure how, what is the kinematics of uh, these rivers. And uh, um, what uh, we used for this is a, a Python package called RiverMap that uh, uh, Paola Pasalakwa's uh, group uh, developed uh, uh, not too long ago. Uh, again, open source software works, uh, works really well, uh, and you can take an image like this, uh, detect uh, the center lines, uh, and uh, generate uh, uh, 
an image of the, the main river and then detect the banks uh, and, and so forth. So you can get uh, uh, data like this uh, uh, through basically as long as Landsat has been around, which is uh, more than 30 years now. Um, so uh, this is the first step in the analysis. Um, next, we want to think about how to estimate migration rates. And uh, one way to do that is to measure these areas between the two center lines. This is not that different from measuring uh, bank erosion. If you want to, it's like averaging the two banks. Uh, but what we wanted to do is to measure the local migration rate and the local curvature. And to do that, to link every point on center line one to center line two to get these vectors, we use again open source software uh, written by Ben Ellis uh, uh, and we use an algorithm called dynamic time warping. This is a fantastic little tool uh, that uh, I'm, I think it should be used more widely in the earth sciences. Uh, and it, there's a lot more to this that interesting discussion that uh, is worth having, but uh, not now. Uh, so we, we apply this uh, to seven rivers in the Amazon basin. Uh, uh, these rivers are relatively untouched by humans, relatively, but uh, uh, so you can, you can detect, you can see really well the uh, kinematics uh, and they move fast enough um, to see it in 30 years. And if I zoom in into this small rectangle here, this is what we see. This is uh, the channel at, uh, uh, here is the channel in 1987, and I highlighted the different bends going from inflection point to inflection point. And then I plot uh, the channel in 2017, uh, again, inflection point to inflection point. This is extremely tempting to take, to say, bend 11 migrates to bend 11. That is incorrect. The, the curvatures around band 11 are not affecting the position of the channel along the next band 11. Those, the impact of those curvatures is actually felt along this segment, uh, which goes from zero migration point to zero migration point. Uh, so going back and forth, back and forth. And, and this is more obvious if you look at the curvature and migration rate plot, and you see that uh, how the, for example, band 11 curvatures are reflected in migration over here. Uh, and there's the lag, which is, which is pretty constant along uh, the same river segment. And I have cherry picked, of course, that example, but we can look at 94 bands along the Jura River, and uh, you can see there is a curvature migration rate that, that oblique shift from the top to the bottom, that's the leg. Uh, there are some bends that behave a little bit differently. Uh, those are the places where you have erodibility issues, I think. Uh, but other than that, it's a, it's a decent correlation, uh, which means uh, that uh, on average, if I remember well, uh, uh, curvature explains uh, more than 50% of the variance uh, in migration in these rivers. And in, in plan view, that's how it, this looks like, the quality of the prediction. There's the prediction in red, and then we plot the 2017 channel. And it's not perfect, of course. For example, over here, uh, uh, there seems to be more migration than what, uh, what you would expect based on the model. Uh, note that there's a, a recent cutoff here. So this is, uh, this is similar to what uh, John Schwenk has found that uh, where you have a cutoff, migration rates increase. And this, uh, uh, this analysis shows that it increases further to what you would expect from curvature alone. Uh, and finally, let's uh, talk for a, a couple of minutes about counterpoint bars. Uh, these are uh, locations where you have deposition along the concave bank. And usually, classically, these are associated with uh, erosional confinement. Uh, so in this place, uh, there's clearly a, some kind of uh, boundary over here, which is guiding these bands to migrate downstream, translate downstream. There is an example from an outcrop where uh, muddier sed sediments are darker, uh, uh, and uh, there's, no, there's no tides involved. There are no tides involved in that case. We know that. Uh, so why do some meanders translate downstream if we have no 
confinement. Uh, and the model basically suggests that you don't necessarily need, con necessarily need confinement to have dancing translation. All you need to consider is that the point of maximum migration, the red, uh, is downstream from the point of maximum curvature, which is black. Uh, in big bands like these, most of these, it still results in expansion, but in small bands like this one, which is, in this case, it's related to a cutoff, it results in translation because the red dot falls on the down limbs, downstream limb of the, of the meander. Here's a counterpoint bar uh, from the Peace River, uh, and Daryl Smith has, uh, and, and others uh, have, have studied uh, uh, these things extensively. Uh, there are some cores that they have taken, and you can see how it goes from sandy to muddy along this bar. We can plot up the, roughly where the boundaries are, uh, and uh, mathematically speaking, this hasn't really been uh, quantified before, but uh, essentially you can, you can quantify it by saying that wherever, whenever the vectors are pointing in the same direction, that's a point bar, and then as I go downstream, uh, they go into opposite directions. So we can try to do that, and uh, we just call this a bar type index. So there is curvature, migration rate. If we multiply the two, we get the red curve. Whenever the red curve goes negative, that's where the counterpoint bars uh, are expected to be. And the more negative that is, uh, the, the more, uh, you know, the bigger the absolute value, the more important this effect is going to be. And that's the illustration in plan view, where whenever you see the brown colors, that's where you would expect more muddy sediment, more counterpoint bar style deposition. And uh, here is an example of a cutoff in a model, in the model, um, and where it's blue, you can see that those are the places where you have deposition along the concave bank. Those are the places where you expect counterpoint bars. Cutoffs and other perturbances are important for the development of translation and uh, this more muddy deposition. Here is an example from, a, from an actual river where uh, blue means uh, counterpoint bars. And you can see how this perturbation here results in lots of translation and lots of uh, counterpoint bars. Here's another one, lots of downstream translation and, and uh, weird uh, deposition with lakes and uh, stagnant water and uh, probably separation zones. There is a whole, whole story there that a that, uh, lot of aspect, aspects of which are not fully understood. Um, and finally, uh, the reason we want to build 3D models and understand these, the distribution of the bar types is uh, one of the reasons is that uh, if you are interested in fluid, fluid flow in porous media, then you can play games like this, where your 3D model slides through many times. Uh, if you put a pressure gradient on this, you can see how the fluid front is going to propag propagate through. And that's what we are watching here. And uh, I try this many times now to predict how this is going to evolve through time, and I cannot. Like, you just have to do it, you have to, have to watch it, and you have to play with it. And uh, I forgot to put that here, but this is, again, a piece of open source, entirely free software, in this case in MATLAB, called MATLAB Reservoir Simulation Toolbox. Super cool stuff. Um, so, to wrap it up, uh, talked about the model a little bit, uh, curvature migration rate relation, uh, relatively simple. Um, satellite imagery and model, the match between them is relatively good, uh, and quantum point bars are relatively common. Uh, thank you. Okay, we have time for a couple of questions. So Jaya was asking if, uh, uh, if we have tied this uh, to dynamics, if you can take into account, for example, that uh, at the cutoff you would have a steeper slope and so on. The answer is no. Um, uh, uh, for me, probably, uh, but uh, 
yeah, it's something to, uh, I, what I'm definitely interested in is to, to maybe start with building, uh, not developing this further, but building, just taking some, some models of the shelf and looking at some of these meander geometries and see what really happens in 3D, how the secondary circulation works. One of the disconnects is that uh, that test how well it works in in the Amazon basin. Uh, that is a one time step, um, and you develop those very elongated meanders through a longer time evolution. Uh, so, using a, only a short time is makes it easier, right? Uh, the other thing is that in the model, in this model anyway, uh, there are no erodibility variations. And uh, I think in the Amazon basin, most of these plot planes are actually pretty homogeneous overall. Like it's all, unless you touch the edge of the inside valley, uh, things are pretty erodible, um, but still there are gonna be minor variations. And once you have those, it is enough to have a big tree over here and uh, it can result, I think, in a, a, the curvature flips. And once the curvature flips, then, the meander becomes segmented, right? Now you have new bands, it, it totally throws off the, the model doesn't capture that, but maybe that's something that wouldn't be so hard to, to experiment with. Great, thanks again, Sylvester.